So we start with this concept of needing to know our space before we go anywhere in the space. A recent conversation I had was, a, was with an artist friend of mine. She's based in Maui, and she called and said, hey, Lindsay, I need a hand ranking for the keyword artist. She's a phenomenal artist. There's no question. Super talented. Her work is all over the world. And yet, we did a quick search and noted that there are 600 million web pages indexed by Google that would like to be number one for the phrase artist. So we had a quick discussion, and I said, Kim, that's great, but we need to take a step back here. Let's get more specific. What are you really good at? And so she gave me another keyword that she was interested in ranking for. Maui post-impressionist artist. Okay. I grew up a bit in the art world with my mom, and I just thought about that for a minute and said, I think now we've got a bit too specific. Let's mm -hmm. run this keyword through a re keyword uh, rank or research tool and see how many people each month are searching for it. And we found zero. So while I might be able to help her achieve this goal, she would now, now rank number one for the keyword of her dreams, and nobody would come to her website, and no one would buy her art. So we try to find that just right, happy medium, via keyword research, and we find the phrase Maui artists. 720 people each month in the US are expected to search for this phrase. That seems a little bit more reasonable. And yes, the competition is still, see, still steep. But she is one of the best artists on Maui, so I think we can go up against the one million other pages that are trying to compete in Google for this. So for your business, I'd like to recommend you start your keyword research and getting to know your space by making a list. Turn to Google and use the Google Search Suggest tool to see what they are telling you other people are looking at for your business. In this case, we started with Maui artists, and we found some other phrases that are really commonly searched for. Words like famous, directory, paintings, local. These all give you context and additional phrases that you may want to expand um, in addition to ranking for just Maui artists for. The next step in our process is to make a list of your top web pages in a spreadsheet. I mentioned earlier that web pages get indexed by Google. So it's actually web pages, not websites, that rank. So what we're going to need to do here is to start to think ahead. We have our list of keywords that we're starting to think about um, of interest for our business. But we need to start to map keywords to pages so that when we get into on-page optimization a few steps down the road, we really have a good focus of where we're going. So I start with a list of, this is a pretty simplistic website, four pages, and then I'm going to start my wish list of what focus keywords I'm going to apply to each. And I'm going to turn to a more quantitative tool set. My qualitative research gave me a few keywords, and now I'm going to start to go and use a handful of um, tools that are out there that are going to help me to estimate monthly search volume. A keyword research tool they're all relatively the same. You enter a keyword, you have a target area, you click the button, and it exports to you typically the monthly search volume, some have competition, and then some may suggest other terms that you might consider. So I start to collect the information. The more in-depth the keyword space, the larger the product or project, the more keyword research tools I may collect data from to find, try to find the trends between them. Once I have my list, I can start to think about how I'm going to map these keywords to my web pages. I'm going to go for typically my mothership keyword on my home page, more often than not. Although SEO is an art and science, so you've got to take all of our advice with a bit of um, a grain of salt, that it needs to be something that you think through for yourself. And then I'm going to go through some of my deeper level pages and pick some other phrases that are relevant to the content there. Two concepts that are important when you're starting to map keywords to pages. One, you want to avoid duplicates, so you don't have two pages on your own website competing with themselves. If those two pages compete, you just made the game a lot harder. A lot of times what we see in this situation is Google says, okay, you want to rank for Maui Artist. Is it your homepage or the portfolio page that I should be ranking for that? And if those two pages are competing against I'll either just randomly select one, or more often than not, you see Google take a turn and go display another result where they have to make less choice. 
The other concept is the idea of combining like terms and ideas. So if I had given this talk five years ago, people would be building websites, or maybe 10 years ago, five to 10 years ago, where if I wanted to rank for the phrase Aspen Yoga, I might have a page that's dedicated to Aspen Yoga and a whole different page dedicated to Yoga and Aspen. And Google basically was so literal that you had to use the same keyword over and over again on a page for them to understand the context and the meaning of it. Now Google and the other search engines have a much broader understanding of language and semantics. So we can start to apply like terms and ideas, things like Maui paintings and Maui prints, potentially and get that page to rank for a multitude of keywords that are related and that don't compete with each other. We're going to set aside our keyword research and move on to some other tips, and we'll circle back around to that later. My second tip for you is establish benchmarks. <coughs> The best tool for establishing benchmarks for many websites is going to be Google Analytics. It's free, it's enterprise level, and it's easy to install on your website. Why do we want Google Analytics? To track performance. I want to know where I am today, to know where I'm going, and to be able to report back on the successes of my SEO initiatives. The how is quite simple. We go to Google Analytics and sign up for an account. They'll give you back a code, and that little line of code in there that says UA dash a whole bunch of numbers, that's what's going to be unique to your website. You take your code, and you're going to apply it to the header of all pages on your website. You can do this directly in the header file in WordPress, or you can utilize a plugin such as Monsters Insights to do it for you. <coughs> Once I have Google Analytics script running on my website, you can take a look and read some online documentation of some advanced setups and configurations you may do, things like excluding your own visits to your website so that you don't skew your traffic. But you're essentially good to go, and you can start to think about a few other benchmarks you may be interested in. As an SEO, I also like rank tracking. Many over the years have considered rank tracking to be somewhat imperfect, but it is data nonetheless. And so I'd recommend taking that keyword list that you generated in tip number one and getting it into some kind of rank tracking software, which is going to help me know where am I today in the keyword rankings and where am I tomorrow. Here's a quick snapshot of what tracking that performance looks over time for a small business website that's actively engaged in SEO. Tip number three. Make sure your website is indexable. That's shorthand for make sure the search engines can find it. So more often than not, the second conversation we have when people are having a hard time with SEO is they say, I launched my website a couple weeks ago. It's a new website. Um, I had great SEO coverage before I made this change, and now I can't even find it when I search for my brand. And it's actually something that I deal with typically about once a month. I have two young kids at home. And our pediatrician's office, I'm looking for their phone number all of the time. And I turn to Google, and I look for it, and I see this no information is available for this page. Well, they're actually pretty lucky. They launched their WordPress website over a year ago, so I've been following along. And Google, at first, ignored their website um, and, and did not include it in their index. And over time, enough people looked for it that they said, yes, We'll include it, but we're not going to give a lot of information here. And it's a little bit awkward for me to uh, tell, I have mentioned it to the pediatrician when they're checking my kids' ears for ear infections and things like that, but talking SEO shop while you're in the doctor's office is not standard practice. So this has continued on and something that I want to help you guys solve for your websites. What's happening here is that the robots.txt file, which is a file in all websites, is telling the search engines to not index it. We like this when a website's in development. We don't want it to get indexed before it's spread. Um, and so there's this directive in the file. And in WordPress, it's typically controlled under settings, reading, and this box is checked while you're in development. So when a new site goes live, the low-hanging fruit and then the central task, if you want the search engines to find it, is to make sure you uncheck this box and hit save. Once you've removed that directive, the search engines have fair game to come and index your website and your web pages, 
and we can start to ask ourselves, how else do we want to communicate with the search engines? We want to provide them with a roadmap of the pages on our website and how we would like them indexed. And one of those roadmaps is an XML sitemap. This is a file that has no user-facing value. It's purely for the search engines. And the reason behind it is if we can give them a roadmap that gives relative priorities and some indexation instructions, like when the page was last updated, we're going to help their crawlers along. They do have limited resources, and so it's really important that we utilize their bandwidth with respect um, and send them down to pages um, and taxonomies in different parts of our website that we want them to show and take the, remove the, the need for them to go to the places that, that we don't want them to go. So here's an example of an XML sitemap generated by Yoast, which is one of our favorite WordPress SEO plugins. And once you install Yoast in your website, they ask you a really simple question for each content type. Do you want to show this content type in the search results? If you answer yes, they're going to create an XML sitemap for you of that. If you answer no, there's going to be no XML sitemap with, in this case, blog posts. Once you have your XML sitemap, you actually have to tell the search engines where it lives. The robots.txt file is universal. It must be named robots.txt. But your XML sitemap can be named just about anything.xml. So you're going to want to turn to the Google Search Console and let them know what you named your XML sitemap and drop it in here. The Google Search Console is your communication channel with Google. No, you can't jump on a phone call and say, why don't I rank for artists? Um, but yes, you can get feedback from them and request things like getting your site re-indexed along the way. Once your XML sitemaps are in the Google Search Console, you're going to get that first bit of feedback. Here I submitted eight, eight web pages and about three images via my XML sitemaps, and I can listen back and see how well Google is interpreting that data and how much they like it. Here we can see I'm eight for eight, so that's a really good ratio. If you have a large WordPress website, say you're submitting 1,200 pages, I wouldn't expect that necessarily all 1,200 of the pages that I think are important are interpreted by Google to also be important, but I'd like to be sort of within that 95% that indexation. We've already talked a bit about that robots.txt file with what not to do, um, but sometimes you'll see robots.txt files with a few more complicated um, line items in there. You can edit this file with Yoast as well if you want to provide a little bit more specific direction, like if you want to keep them out of a subfolder or a section of your website. In general, with robots.txt files, simplicity is best. So make sure that the search engines can get in there, provide them with minimal directives, and let them kind of take it from there. We really want to confirm we got it right, because if our on-page optimization and everything else is perfect, but the search engines are still struggling to index our website, my web pages are not going to appear. In the Google Search Console, I can use the index status report. Here you can see a site that was in development for a while and then went live, and you can see how quickly Google indexed that content and then see how the, the traffic started, or the, the indexation grew just a touch. And I can also turn to um, Google itself and put in the directive site, semicolon, and then the domain and see how many results I get back. That number, about 26 results, should be in line with a, a, the general framework of how many pages on your website you'd like Google to know about. Next up, optimize for speed. Site speed matters for SEO. Why? A faster website creates a better user experience, and search engines care about user experience. So I hope you caught my friend Chris Lemma's talk um, about two hours ago about speeding up your WooCommerce website, because a lot of the tips were applicable to all WordPress websites and things we should be thinking about. For optimizing for speed, I'd recommend you start with a benchmark and evaluation tool, something like Google PageSpeed Insi Insights or Pingdom. Go and get a grade and start to get feedback. And then start to address the issues. One, ask yourself, are all of the plugins on my website in use and required? Another is, is there anything I can do to improve performance by using a plugin, such as WP Smush or Auto Optimize, to improve caching, image size, 
um, and other performance issues. And another might be considering a content delivery network. So these are a few tips and a very cursory overview of some things you can be doing to talk site speed. If you're a site owner, I'd recommend you speak with your developer about this um, as a, an important topic and something they may be able to assist you with. And also um, speak with your host to see what they can do to help you speed up your website. Tip number five, update your page titles and meta descriptions. So we started with one of the most challenging aspects of SEO, which is keyword research. This is where that art and science component collides and leads to a lot of questions. We're gonna circle back around now on what do we do with that research in hand. Page titles and meta descriptions are HTML tags in the header of a web page, and they provide the search engines with information about that page before they even get into the body content. They often extract this information and display it in the search results. So here you can see the page title and the meta description from a Google search results page. Why are they important? Sorry, I think there's a question, question. back there. Dive so in. the meta was really long. So should you do a long meta like that, like almost a paragraph, or should you do like keyword focused meta? Yeah, so I'd recommend utilizing the, the full length of the meta description, and I'll go ahead and give you a handful of tips um, for how to write these. So page titles and meta descriptions, why should I care about them? They influence ranking and improve click through rates. And to get more specific, the page title has an influence on rank and click through rates, meaning how often someone's actually going to click on my listing when they see it. The meta description only actually impacts click through rates and doesn't have an influence on your rank. But they're really important because you're given two search results here and people are being asked to make a split second decision. Which one am I going to click on? These two listings are fairly similar, but I can see the meta description on the first is something that I can easily read and digest, whereas the meta description on the second feels a little overly optimized. There's lots of phrases stuffed with commas separating them, and I actually have no idea what I'm about to experience when I go and visit this website. So we're going to go back to our spreadsheet. I like to think of it as sort of my SEO workbook, something that I keep going on an ongoing basis. And we have our pages listed, we have our focus keywords, we're going to add a column for page title and meta description, and start to think about how we want to craft these. Page titles influence rank and click-through rates, and there are some basic parameters that you can think about when you're writing them. The first is we're aiming for something 50 to 60 characters long if we want to maximize the space given to us. They're typically formatted like the title of a book with capitalization. Most page titles and meta or page titles you're going to see have some type of a standard separator that's consistently used throughout the website, such as a vertical bar or a dash. They need to be unique for every page of your website. And if you need sort of a rules-based approach, you can often think about placing the keyword of importance, that focus keyword first, followed by some kind of a separator and your brand. The one exception I tend to make to that is on my homepage, I tend to flip-flop that around, place my brand first, and my most important keyword after the dash or the vertical bar, because the majority of most people's website traffic is, is coming from the brand and not necessarily the, the keyword that you're optimizing. Here are a couple of examples to help um, explain some good, better, and needs improvement. Um, we'll start with this same phrase, Maui artist. And you can see here, we've placed the keyword first in our great example with a vertical bar and then the artist's name. What I like about this is the search engines actually weight the keywords that um, come first or are on the left with a little bit more weight than what's coming second, which is the brand. So if I'm really trying to aggressively go after this keyword, I could place the keyword first there and then follow up with the artist's name. A good example uses the character count maybe a bit better, um, gets closer to the 60 character counts, but starts to put in some other phrases like Maui art by Maui artist Kim McDonald. Yes, this is great. You've included two keywords in your page title. They're related. And maybe in the, the old school algorithms, um, they needed that literal usage of the keyword um, in different permutations so closely together. But for me, it's a bit of a mouthful. 
It feels a touch over-optimized, so it's good, but I think we could do better by actually making it um, simpler. The needs improvement we see all too often, which is the word home, and then the brand, and something that you want to try to avoid, because we all know that the home page is the home page, and the search engines don't need to be reminded of it either. Let's talk a bit more about meta descriptions. These are going to influence click-through rates and not rank. New in 2018 is the target link. We used to be limited to 155 characters for our meta descriptions, and Google is now showing 260 to 320, with around 300 being the kind of new industry standard of how long your meta descriptions should be written towards. Typically, they're written in sentence format, so we saw earlier what it looks like when you just put keywords with commas, um, not super engaging. They need, need to, once again, be unique for every page on your website, and I like to think of them as something that's going to lead to conversion. So I'm going to include some kind of a call to action that tells people not only what they're going to experience when they get to that web page, but also what I want them to do. And there's been studies that show that if you lead people into that action before they ever reach the page, they're more likely to buy, they're more likely to engage with the page in whatever its, its true intent is. So let's look at two examples. In this case, great and needs improvement. The first is uh, more captivating. It's written in sentence format. And it includes important phrases like the artist's name and what you might expect to see and what we want them to do. Explore her work and um, see what makes her stand out. The second is something that needs improvement. It does hit home. It tells you we're about to go see an artist's website and we want you to go explore her artwork. But there's no other context, and I'm very unlikely to engage with this page and click to the search result. Once I have my page titles and my meta descriptions typically written in that SEO workbook, now I need to get them into my website. And here's where Yoast comes in handy yet again. I can go into each page and simply copy and paste my page title and my meta description, and I can even drop in my focus keyword just to get some of the, uh, the grading, content grading tools working. Um, into the page and hit save. So we have a couple of extra minutes this afternoon and I want to share with you one bonus tip. And this is going to start to move outside of the world of what you can do on your website to improve your organic search and start to think about this world of off-site SEO. So there is a world beyond your website that gives the search engines context around your brand and around your website. And one of those big things for a local business is Google Maps. Why do we care about Google Maps? Customers are looking. One in three searches are about a place, and 97% of consumers search for local businesses online. In the beginning of my talk, we saw the very competitive search landscape for San Diego hotels. Hundreds, if not thousands of hotels competing to be number one, and then also having to compete against things like Expedia or Hotels.com. Where a local business can stand out and rise above the crowd is via the three pack a local search. So these three businesses are doing a great job of managing and maintaining their Google My Business listing. Here's how you can. I guess the, the second reason why is it's great for branding in the search. So if someone searches for your business by brand name, oftentimes if you have a solid Google Maps listing, in addition to seeing you in the organic search results, they're going to see your Google My Business listing in the right hand column. Um, with additional information about your business. Things about where you're located, how many Google reviews you have, hours of operation, and beyond. To get a Google Maps listing, you need to go to Google My Business and prove not only your association with the business, but also the business's uh, location information. Depending on how much trust they already have in your business, they're going to give you one of these five options to allow you to proceed. Oftentimes, and for almost every business, they'll let you verify via postcard. So you say, here's my address, here's my name, this is my login to Google. They're going to send you a postcard. It takes a week to two weeks to arrive. It has a six-digit pin on it. You enter this six-digit pin back into Google My Business, and poof, you have access to start managing your listing. The quicker solution is by phone. Um, they're going to give you an automated phone call, and you're going to go through that process um, just via a quick phone call to your business line. 
Sometimes you get the option of verifying via email. More often than not, they tell you what email they're comfortable sending it to. You don't get to control it. And so this is one that a lot of times it ends up being some kind of an admin or a systems email that they may have associated with your business. And uh, depending on the size of your organization, you might just get lost into cyberspace. If you've gone through the process of verifying with the Google Search Console when we were doing the XML sitemap work, you may get super lucky and get the option to instantly verify via your business listing. And basically they'll say, okay, you've shown us that you're a webmaster for this website and we have such trust that this website is associated with this physical address that we're just going to go ahead and give you access to your Google My Business listing. We need no more proof about you. Full clarification is a, a seldom used option for most local businesses because it's for people with more than 10 locations. Um, but something to think about if you're a chain and you need to go through this process in volume. Once you have access to your Google My Business listing, the top tip is to try to go out and get reviews and high quality reviews. So now what, I hope today's talk leaves you feeling like you have a bit of an SEO process in mind, some solid steps that you can go take action to drive new customers to your website. Thank you again for your time. I'm Lindsay Halsey, I live in Colorado, and I am an SEO consultant um, whose latest venture is distilling 10 years of SEO experience into an SEO process. Check it out at WPSEOHub.com. Thank you. Thank you. 